Hey, I'm Sean, and here are 10 of the major updates we're introducing with SUP2 for the High Five. The Hi5 is ARRI's flagship hand unit for wireless camera and lens control. And Software Update Package 2, or SUP2, as I'll probably refer to it as, contains a bunch of new features, which is why we've kind of designated it as the second major release for the firmware. We're not just adding little bits and pieces, this is a significant release. So in this video, I'm gonna talk through the 10 major updates that we've introduced which mainly encompass new features that will change the way you work with the High Five, but there are plenty of other smaller changes, little usability updates and bug fixes, and all of those changes you can find detailed in the release notes on the website in the same place where you can download the new SUP for yourself. Now, I really recommend reading the release notes because A, it will detail all the other little changes that you might be interested in, but it also has very specific instructions for how to download and install the new software update package. All right, without further ado, let's get into feature number one. A frequency analyzer tool to help you choose a radio channel on set has been a very highly requested feature for the Hi5 and we're happy to introduce it with SUP2. Now the frequency analyzer will only work with the RF EMIT module in the Hi5. If you're using the RF2400 or RF900 radio modules, well, they don't operate on a specific frequency, so it doesn't really work. However, it is fantastic when you're using the RF EMIT module, which is the module that the Seaforce Mini RF and the UMC have as a default module. And it's the radio module that's in most of our cameras, including the Alexa 35. And of course, you can put the same RF EMIT module I have in the Hi5 here into the rear if you like. It's the radio module with a little white band on it. Now, once you have that radio module in the Hi5, if you press onto the radio menu, you'll notice that there is a new option here for frequency analysis. Analyzer, and if I click on that, then you get this nice graphical indication of how much radio traffic there is on each of the wireless channels. So I can scroll up and down here and choose a, a radio channel, which will then immediately set the high five to that radio channel, and I just need to change it to the corresponding one on my motor controller or camera. You'll notice that the order of the numbers on the left hand side here is a little strange, and that's because the channels are organized as a default by the frequency, which is what those numbers are on the right hand side. And that's to remind you that there are a couple of channels which have very different numbers that are very close together. For example, if you look on the left, channel one and channel eight are only five megahertz apart out of a band which is nearly 100 megahertz wide. So they're very close together and they shouldn't be used if they're the only two radio channels you're using on set. You should choose two which are very far apart in terms of their frequency so that they don't overlap with one another. If you prefer, you can resort those radio channels by hitting the sort button so that they're now in order of the radio channel. The other thing to note with the frequency analyzer is that that is taking a measurement at the position of the antenna, in this case on the high five which means that you can walk around your set and use it as a bit of a wireless sniffer to see if there are any devices that are really heavily polluting the atmosphere and causing a lot of interference. And it's also useful for going and checking out other areas like by the camera and seeing what the wireless spectrum is doing here. And then I could walk back to my focus station and make sure that the channel that was good near the camera is also good at my focus station just to get the best indication of which one you should be using for a strong connection. All right, major update number two. Feature two is user buttons, and we've really made some big changes to how user buttons work, which will enable you to change them more easily and also to set up the Hi5 in a way that is much more customized and suited to the way that you would like to work. First off, we've now put a little reminder, if you don't have a function set to a user button and you press it, well, you'll now get a little reminder that the user button is not assigned, hold funk and the user button to assign. Now that, points out a little shortcut we've also added. So for any of the user buttons on the High Five, if you hold down the function button on the front and then press the user button, you'll be taken straight to the menu where you can set the function for that button. 
The other big change that we've done with the user buttons is that we've added kind of a fourth home page display. So by pressing function, you can go through and change the function that the six buttons above and below the screen do. So that's normally where you would set your marks and your limits. And you'll notice that there is now a fourth option for that page. And this page is basically completely customizable. It defaults as the user button page. So I can set any camera user button to one of those six user buttons. I could set any button that the high five can normally trigger to one of those user buttons. And I can also set menu shortcuts to one of those user buttons. So you can go through and make a completely customizable kind of home layout, which when you go into the menu and then go back to the home screen, it will go back to that user button page if you've left it there. So we really expect that this is the page that most people will kind of leave their high five set to for most of the time. The other nice thing with the user button page is that you'll see that I have all these little named buttons here. And that's because you can rename any of the user buttons that you set to those functions, which means again, you can have a completely customizable display. So tell us what you do with your user buttons. And if you have any questions about user buttons, put them in the comments. Here we go for number three. Update number three is what we're calling predictive lens mapping. So this is an update to the existing lens mapping workflow, which uses kind of a predictive element to reduce the time it takes to make a lens map significantly. If you go into the lens mapping part of the high five, all of that kind of happens as per normal. You'll notice there's one small change in that we've moved the calibration step much further in the process after you enter the lens name and the serial number and all of that. And that just means that if you go into the lens programming menu, it won't wipe the lens file you currently had on the high five, which used to happen. But once you get in there and you get to the lens programming section and you go to program and access, well, the first couple of steps are still the same. So I move my lens to infinity and I set my infinity mark. And then I also set my minimum focus mark, which on this lens is 10 inches. And then you'll notice when you go to the next focus mark available, which for me is 11 inches, the high five already says 11 inches. So I don't need to adjust the number for the next mark that I'm putting in. I just press the OK button, which the shortcut is use a button three on the back. Then one foot, the high five already has one foot here, one foot three inches. Okay, I have to make a slight correction there. It's saying 16 inches. So I just press the button once to go to 15 inches, and I'll add that mark. And then the next one, one foot and a half. So again, that's bang on 18 inches. So you can see that we're basically using our knowledge of the focus scale of most lenses to give you a prediction of what the marks are going to be. And that's basically meant that I can go through this whole lens. Okay, that's the second time I've had to adjust a focus mark. And six foot. 10 foot's bang on, 20 feet, bang on. So that has drastically reduced the amount of time it will take me to make a lens map because I don't have to set that focus distance every time. And then I can press finish and move on to iris. Now there's another little change for lens files. And that is with the lens file browser, which is feature number four for SUP2. So the lens file browser is a much more granular and technical interface for interacting with your lens files and your folders of lens files. So it's basically going to help you get organized with all your lens files you might need for a particular job or if you're a commercial AC bouncing between different camera kits all the time. So if you go into the lens menu on the high five and then lens files, you'll notice the exact same interface that's always lived there, which will either be your recent most lens files, your 10 most recent ones, or it'll be your favorites, which is kind of new with this update. So if you press the extra little button that's popped up down the bottom, which says browser, you'll be taken to the new lens file browser. And you can see here that I've set up a folder called ACAM and one called BCAM inside the internal storage. And then there is a bunch of other lens files here. The Key things to know. So I, I can immediately select a lens file and use it and then send it to the camera wirelessly and that becomes the lens file, lens file that I'm using. So you can see a lot more lens files in this list view than you can in the previous one. I can also expand and collapse different folders that I have here and then go to those lens files and again, edit them or send them to the camera to be used. 
I can also set a folder to be the favorites folder. Now that I do by just pressing favorite at the bottom right or with user button number three on the back here. And when I go back one step, you'll see that the favorites page has changed to be whatever folder I select to be the favorites folder in the lens browser. So that could be the recent folder, it could be my internal storage folder like the root folder, which already does have a couple of lens files in it, or I can select a subfolder to be the favorite. And the handy thing with that is that if you are organized and you put your lens files into subfolders, it's very easy to change between groups of folders or groups of files. So for example, you might have the A cam on set with its own set of lenses and then there's a B cam with its own set of lenses and if you have to change what camera you're pulling focus on, you can very quickly just change the favorites page to be the folder corresponding to the lens files for each camera. That's what I've done here. So I have a set of lenses in one and a set of lenses in the other and I can change the favorite for that and quickly have all the lenses that I need to see ready to go. There's a lot more you can do with this browser. I'll just show you, show you one more thing and that is that you can of course add and delete um, folders here. So if you select uh, or move your cursor with the force pad up here over one of the folders in the browser and add a directory, it will make a subfolder wherever you had the cursor set to. So I might set a CCAM and then you'll see that that is added as another little folder in this whole list but the arrow is hollow, not full of color because I can't collapse or expand it because there is no lens files in there. So to move lens files into that folder, I change the mode of the browser button on the top right and then I get little check boxes. So I can go ahead and select all of those lens files that were in my root directory and then I hit the cut copy button and then the interface will change and I select what folder I want to move those lens files into which would be C camera. So they are now copied across and you also have the option to move them instead of copy them if you prefer, which hey, I probably should have done. But in this case, I'm just going to select those ones that were in the root folder and not where they have been copied to and then I can hit erase and remove them. So you can see it's just like a file browser on a PC or a Mac. There is a lot you can do with this, but it's going to make I think your life on multi-camera jobs really handy when you can have the time to be organized and then quickly flick between the groups of lens files you need to use at any given time. Feature number five is that we have two new types of smart focus rings. We now have dedicated rings for left-handed focus pullers and also for right-handed focus pullers who prefer to pull in what would traditionally be a reverse direction. Now, as these are smart focus rings, they will be automatically detected when I put them onto the high five. So if I take this reverse direction ring and snap it on here, then the high five will automatically change the focus knob to be uh, behaving in the opposite direction to normal. So this is now going towards infinity. And the same thing will happen if I put the left-handed smart focus ring on. If I clip it here, you'll notice that the display will automatically flip upside down so that it makes sense when you're pulling focus as a lefty. The nice thing is that if I pull the rings off, for whatever reason, maybe I need to get closer to mins if I don't have that ring on, well then the high five will stay in left-handed mode because it thinks that you're operating in left-handed mode, for example. You can manually set a reverse knob direction in the control setup menu, and that's where you'll find the switch for left-handed mode as well. And of course, if I put one of the traditional rings back on, it will just go back to the normal mode. Now, these rings look very similar, but they have a little R or an L next to the minimum focus measurement to designate what kind of ring they are. And they are available in exactly the same kinds of rings that are available for the traditional ones. So that's 10 rings in both imperial and metric measurements depending on the minimum focus of the lens or just of how you want to run your high five. All right, the next one. Feature number six is smart iris rings. Now these look very similar to the smart focus rings and the design may be for a DIT or a DP who would like to have the full functionality of the high five with camera control and user buttons, but they're just changing iris and therefore would like to use the larger knob here, which is a bit more ergonomic and you can have more finesse with that. So if I take off my smart focus ring and put on one of the smart iris rings, you'll notice that the high five automatically then switches control of the iris to the focus knob 
here and it will also change the side of the display which shows the iris values so it's now on the right hand side right next to the knob which has your iris ring on it. The iris rings come in five flavors so there's one designed for lenses up to a maximum stop of T1 then there is a T1.4 ring, a T2 ring and a T2.8 ring. The fifth iris ring goes from T1 to a closed iris for those lenses which might typically be broadcast style lenses which have a closed iris position as well as the minimum t-stop value. Now the other nice thing is if I pull this off it will of course leave the knob dedicated to the iris axis unless I put a focus ring back on which shows you that it is possible to do this with just plain rings as well. So if you don't have the smart iris rings you can also put the scale for the iris on the right hand side next to the knob. You could mark up your own um, iris ring just using a plain ring and then go page across into control setup and when you change the knob to be controlling iris you will get this extra little option pop up to have the scale side selected. So the scale side can either be on the slider side of the display or it can be on the knob side of the display which is a new feature if you're just using a high five for iris or predominantly for iris and would like to have it that way. Feature number seven is that we've introduced a toggle mode for focus tracking. Now focus tracking has been supported for quite some time and it's where you let the distance measuring device like a focus bug or a C-Finder or the ARRI UDM-1 control the focus motor so that there's kind of an autofocus style thing going on. It can be really helpful in a, a whole bunch of situations, least of all when you're stepping away from the camera while an operator is lining up a shot, they're going to be in the ballpark with their focus. Now previously you had to hold down a button because we only had like a momentary switch where you pressed it and then it would focus to that point and then you would have to let go to get it to go back. Toggle mode just means that you can press it once to turn it on like this and then it will pull focus to the distance measured until I turn it off again. When you have it on, you can also move your focus knob, which won't do anything, but it's a good way to follow that green arrow around so that when you turn off, you don't get much of a jump on the focus scale when you go back to having control on your focus knob. The other change that we've made is just to make it more obvious when focus tracking is enabled and we've now inverted the colors on the focus position a little display here in the middle when focus tracking is engaged. So it will now be black text on a yellow background is very obvious and you can be sure you know what's going on if you go to move your knob and nothing happens it's because you're in focus tracking mode. All right number eight. Feature number eight is distance arrow damping. So that will allow you to slow down the jitteriness of the little green triangle that you can chase around the focus scale, which is basically showing you what the readout is from your distance measuring device. So to get there, you have to go page across twice into the menu and then control setup. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that you can set the distance arrow damping anywhere from zero to 25. And that will just slow down the responsiveness of the arrow that's on the focus scale. It will not change the damping or the responsiveness of either the distance measuring device or the readout in the green numbers section just above the focus scale representation. It will just change the damping for the arrow which will make it a little easier to follow around and it's just a user preference kind of thing which some people have asked for so that's now in the high five. Feature number nine is tally status knob color. Now, since the High Five was released, you've been able to set the backlight on the focus knob to one of a number of colors. But now you can set it to reflect the tally status of the camera you're connected to. So you can see it's green at the moment. And if I press the record button here, it will change to red to signify that the camera is rolling. Similarly, if you pop the card out, you know, the knob color will change to blue to signify that there is no card currently in the camera. To set this up, you can go into the new settings page in the menu. So if you go across, press page twice, you'll notice that there is a new option for settings where we've now grouped the light and color, the vibration and the audio menus just to shorten up the main menu page a little bit. If you go into light and color, scroll down, change your knob color to tally status. Now there's also two other new options in here and that is that there is a internal marks setting and an external marks setting. 
Previously, by default, all of the marks that you set on a high five for your focus, iris, and zoom axes, they've been rainbow, which was introduced with the WCU4. We've now changed the default to be white for any marks that you set internally on the high five. And external marks, which you can of course do with the focus bug system, well now they'll show as green. So they are the defaults. You can change them around, you can set them back to being rainbow if you like, totally up to you. We just think this new default method is a bit clearer and easier to understand at a glance. And lucky last is manual T-stops and manual focal lengths. So if you only have one lens motor, for example, like right here, where I just have a lens on the focus axis, you can put in a manual T-stop into the high five so that you get a depth of field indicator. So you just go to the lens menu and then scroll down a little bit and you'll see manual T-stop and then you can put any T-stop you like in. When you press set, your lens starter will now be updated with a depth of field indicator, which can be very useful. Now a manual focal length would be the same thing if you're using a zoom lens. Previously, you could only do this if the lens file that you were using only had focus information in it, but now we've made it possible to use any lens table that you have, even if you've already made the lens file with the iris or the zoom information, you can still set a manual value now if you don't have a lens connected. Oh, and we have a secret number 11 for those who've watched until the end of the video, and that is that we've introduced a screensaver mode, which is just a little bit of fun. And if you press the function and the on off button together, it will go into this new mode with a fireworks display on the screen and a bunch of different colors on the focus knob so that if you're leaving your high five unattended, you can just leave it in this fun little mode and have a bit of a disco. To get out of the screensaver mode, you can press any button to return back exactly where you were. Check it out. All right, we're nearly done here. Just a couple of other small little things. Firstly, go and read the release notes. It's a great resource to find out about all the other small things that we've changed with the interface and with the menu structure that I'm not gonna cover in this video. Secondly, I just wanna to touch on hiding axes and locking axes. So we've added a little indicator now. If you have locked the touchscreen or the force pad, which is a little padlock that will sit between the signal strength indicator and the Bluetooth indicator. So if you go to control setup, you'll see that there are two little checkboxes for disable touchscreen and disable force pad, and you will now be alerted if you've set one of those and forgotten about it and just think that your high five is non-responsive. Secondly, you can lock the whole high five by double pressing the power button. You'll get a big indicator in the center of the screen, which will eventually go away and you'll be left again with that little padlock indicator in between signal strength and the Bluetooth icon. Another change that we've made, which was a little bit confusing to some people in the past, is that previously we had focus, iris, and zoom written down the bottom on the default lens data display page, and they actually hid the lens data for focus, iris, and zoom. That functionality still exists, but it's been moved to the second lens data display page and re to be hide focus, iris, and zoom. And you can also see you can lock individual axes there as well. There is also a SUP2 going to be available for the rear. So you, if you are using a rear one, make sure you update that as well so that it works properly with SUP2 for the high five. All right, that's about it. If you have any questions, throw them in the comments below or start a new little thread over at Focus Puller at Work where we have the ARRI forum. I'll be very happy to get back to you with all your weird and wonderful questions. So please ask away. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.